Hello, everyone. My name is A.P. Anderson. I'm a research and instruction librarian at Velma K. Waters Library here at Tamu C. And today I wanted to talk to you about some introductory topics related to generative AI as it relates to higher education. So I'm going to start out with a couple of um, basic definitions. For the most part, this, pre this presentation is going to be talking about um, text generation tools similar to ChatGPT, but we're also going to touch a little bit on uh, image generation as well. So generative AI is kind of the umbrella term for a lot of different kinds of technology. Basically what they do in very simple terms is that they have a data, a data set that they have, uh, that has been fed to this tool and it has learned patterns from that and it can replicate new content based on the rules that it has learned. Uh, you can have so many different kinds of modalities uh, created using generative AI. They are coming out with new ones all of the time. Uh, code, computer code, is one of the big areas where this is very possible and uh, kind of a growth area because it has such um, specific rules for what makes good code. It's easy to replicate. So large language model is kind of the square to the rectangle of generative AI. This is where ChatGPT fits in along with Claude and Google Bard and all of the others that are that chatbot type, uh, as well as other text generation tools that don't chat with you. What they do is they are predicting the next word in a series. And so that, that is, that is the, the thing that they have been taught to do with their pattern data. They know what a sentence is only because they have been fed so many different sentences that they can make a mathematical guess about what the next probable word in series is. They are not necessarily intelligent. Uh, it's kind of a misnomer term. There is no thinking as we understand it. It's all prediction and the replication of pattern. They don't know what the words they are using mean. Uh, they don't know the relationship between them other than just basic frequency. Um, there is a, a quote there at the bottom, blurry JPEG versus Google seeking quotes. This is from a, a wonderful article I've, I've linked at the end of the presentation explaining how ChatGPT averages out its understanding of human language uh, based on the corpus it's been trained on. And it's basically when you take a photograph, uh, it's the metaphor they use is when you take a, a photograph, a JPEG, and you can uh, contract it, you make it smaller, all of the pixels in that average out. So the same image can be represented using a smaller number of parts. And if you're looking at it from a distance, it's pretty similar to the original image, even though it's been compressed. However, if you zoom in, you see that the color in all of the pixels has been kind of blurred together in order to save space. ChatGPT, for example, uh, was trained on a data scrape of basically every part of the English-speaking inter internet and several parts of the internet from other languages that it could reach. It's so large that it could not represent that much data unless there was compression happening. And so when ChatGPT pulls a quote from somewhere or it, it gives an opinion, that isn't something it's pulling from some specific place in the data set. It's averaging together everything everyone has said about it. An example that gets used is if you ask ChatGPT, what is the meaning of the green light in The Great Gatsby? And it gives you an answer. That's not one person's specific quote that it's pulling, like it would be if you Googled that and, and got a quote pulled from Google. It's averaging together everything everybody has ever said about the green light that it has access to and is able to recall in that moment. So ChatGPT. This one uh, is only one tool out of many. I'm not convinced it's going to be the one that has sticking power personally, but it's important to talk about it now because it's one of the ones that a lot of our students are familiar with and are using, and a lot of our faculty are using as well. There are two versions of it that are live right now. 3.5 is free to use, but it does not have access to anything that was prior to December of 2021. That was when the data scrape ended that built its data set that it was trained on. Uh, and it isn't connected to anything new. So if you ask it for opinions about something that is a current event, so if you were to ask it, what's the deal with you know, the, the, you know, the war in Ukraine as of this month, it would probably give you a guess. And it, if you gave it a specific date, it would probably even tell you, I'm not trained on, modern, you know, on, the, on the current internet. But if you didn't give any indication that this is recent, it might just give you an answer. However, 4.0, which you can get access to with a paid subscription model, 
it can access to the inter get into access to the internet. And so its data set is even larger, and it is training itself on more and more at once. However, does this result in higher precision? Unsure. It has more that it can draw on, but it's all coming down to how it's establishing those patterns. ChatGPT is a chatbot, and this is something very important to keep in mind. Its purpose isn't to give you accurate information or to exist as a research tool. It's meant to have conversations with people and replicate what a conversation might be like. And so the way that the conversation works is that you create prompts for it and it gives you a response. There is some artistry to it, prompt engineering is the term, where you can refine those prompts to get very specific content. You can ask the tool to take on a role. So say, write this answer as if you were my grandma. Write this answer as if you were Chaucer. Uh, and so it can then adapt what it's doing. But it is ultimately, at the end of the day, a conversation. And it's trained to give you input it thinks you want. So it is something of a digital yes man. So image generation, very briefly, they are generative and there are two general types. There is the older model, the GANs, the generative adversarial networks, where they have two algorithms that are kind of working in a loop until it gets you what you want. So we have the, the generator that is creating the image, and it's, it's, you give it a prompt. Like you say, give me a picture of a hippopotamus riding a unicycle. And so it's going to look at its data set and everything that has been tagged, and it's going to try to find hippopotamuses and unicycles, and it's going to try to get something that's close. And then you have the discriminator who looks at that result and then looks back at the data set and it says, that doesn't look like a hippopotamus, try again. And so it goes over and over and over again until it gives you something that matches the characteristics of the, of the prompt and the tags and the metadata in the images in its data set. A diffusion tool is similar, it's just a little bit more straightforward. So what it does is it creates uh, a layer of static basically, uh, random pixels in, in, on the page. And then using the tags in the data set and in the prompt that it's given, it averages those, those pixels together in the static field until it becomes the image that it wants. And it gets more and more refined as it goes. And it's all visual noise. And so that is just basically how those work. So uh, I wanted to say, typically, the, the images that are produced are not copies of anything that individually exists. It's not, unless you tell it to give you like a famous painting, it would give you its, its best shot at replicating it. But it does mimic a lot of harm, hallmarks of photographer, artist, and, and, and graphic designer styles. And that's one of the things you can do with, you can have it assume the role of the artist, and it can try to give you Picasso's take on Mona Lisa. And so how does it do this? Again, it's a data set. And most of these tools that uh, are out there for image generation for free, uh, they scraped the internet. And they scraped them from a variety of places. So some of it comes from uh, social media, including artists' social media. Some of them are Wikipedia, uh, museum catalogs, things like that, news sites. Interestingly, on, the, on news sites and stock image sites, Getty Images is in the process of suing uh, some image generation tools because they have learned to recreate the Getty Images watermark on top of images where people ask it for pictures of historical events. Uh, and then the annotation, as mentioned earlier, which is where the tool gets its meaning from about what images mean, that annotation can sometimes be done by humans. So they're looking at this huge scraped data set and they're saying, okay, this is a hippopotamus, this is a cat, this is a dog, uh, this is Richard Nixon. Or maybe it's another level of AI doing that labeling. And it just depends on what the tool is. And so there can be inaccuracy in the labeling that can then result in inaccuracy in the output. So just something to be aware of. Uh, I don't want to get into too much detail about the tools available. Um, it, the general thing is that the better the tool is, the more it's going to expect you to pay. Um, bottom line there. Um, we do have a TAMUC policy about AI use. It was created over the summer uh, to be included as part of the uh, syllabus template. What it boils down to is that it is up to individual instructors whether they're going to allow AI use in their classroom and in what capacity. There is no blanket ban. 
and there is no blanket requirement that students or instructors use it. However, it's important to get the language right in your assignment descriptions if you are going to allow it, because right now, the way it is phrased, if instructors don't provide guidelines on how it can be used, the assumption is that it is banned in your course. And it's important to realize that students are going to potentially be the ones that are on the hook for this if they are using something that is disallowed. And so it's, it's a situation with um, communication and the assumption that, yes, some students are going to cheat, but others just want to do the best job that they can with the tools they're allowed to. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what it means by AI tools because it's way more than just chat GPT that can fall under this umbrella. So it does say if you use uh, AI anywhere in your work, the students have to cite it. These are two examples of style manuals that have already started tackling the how do we, ta how do we cite AI content uh, problem. Basically, every style manual out there for every discipline is having this conversation right now. And I, I picked MLA and APA because they kind of represent opposite ends of the spectrum as it relates to the attitude they have towards AI. MLA says there is no author for AI-generated text. If you were to look at a normal MLA citation, it would start with the author's name. But they say, this wasn't written by a person. It doesn't have an author. Start with the prompt. Versus APA that's like, yes, it has an author. It's the company that owns the tool. So if you're citing something from ChatGPT, you would cite OpenAI. And it does not have you use the large language, or it does not have you include the prompt right in the citation. It wants you to include it in an appendix. But in both cases, they do want you to describe somewhere in the paper how the tool was used, more than just citing it. it, it you need to describe how and when and, and why and the methodology of it as well. There's, a, there's an element of justification that is required. MLA is a little bit you know, looser about what that means. APA, they're telling you, hey, put all of the text of all of your conversations in an in a appendix if you can, because, and this is important, uh, the URL for this citation in APA is just chat.openai.com slash chat. OpenAI and, and ChatGPT don't give you unique URLs for each conversation. So after your instance ends and that data is deleted, there is no way for an external person to go back and look and see what it said and you said and what prompts you used. That information is essentially gone. It just links back to the tool in general. Uh, and so having a transcript of the chat is one way of making it a little bit more transparent about what actually transpired. So as for academic integrity, there are a lot of different tools that are uh, especially emerging into the market right now that have AI baked into it. Grammarly is an AI tool. There are uh, AI assistants that are being rolled out in a lot of different word processors and other productivity um, type suites like that. And under the current template, that could potentially be banned if a professor does not specify. Uh, so it's, it's important to have conversations with students and let them know, OK, it's I'm all right with it if you look at your paper and you have it check your grammar. Or I'm OK with you using it for translation help or brainstorming. But I don't want you to turn anything in that is not your own words. Uh, and, or don't use it at all. Just you know, write it in a Word document, email it to me, and it's fine. Or you know, as long as you cite it, it's cool. So wherever your class fits um, along that continuum of ban to total allowance, it just, the students need to be able to know so that they can try to get it right. Um, there are lots of different ways that students can use these tools to help themselves, um, but it's just going to need to fit in with the specific course and the specific assignment. Uh, students were cheating a long time before ChatGPT came around. They're going to be cheating as long as there are students. There, there has been cheating as long as there have been students. What AI does is it allows them to do it faster, and it allows them to do it with even less effort. Um, it just makes it easier. So one of the ways that you can ensure that your students aren't just handing you a whole paper that ChatGPT cooked up with them is if this is something that you would be interested in doing, 
you can have, it turn, have them turn it into you as a Google Doc with version history enabled. Because you can see this is a paper that they've been working on for two weeks. I can, they, they added this part and removed it. It won't tell you that no part of it came from ChatGPT or another text generation tool, but it shows that there is a pattern of effort. And the reason that I, that I bring this up is that there are actually news articles that are addressed to students telling them how to protect themselves against allegations of cheating. This is a kind of uh, fear that a lot of our students have uh, that they might be falsely accused of using one of these tools when they didn't. Uh, and it's a source of anxiety. And so some of, some of the students have already figured this out. They're already doing everything in Google Docs so that they can say, look, I did this, it was me, I promise. Um, but it's a, it's a good way that there can be that collaboration and com conversation between instructors and students to make sure everything's above board. Um, so I would caution very strongly against any tool that claims to be able to tell you that it can detect AI. Um, a lot of them make some very outrageous claims of like 98% effectiveness. I haven't really seen that. I've tested a few of them myself, um, feeding them samples of my own writing versus writing that was AI generated. And it, honestly, the ones that I tested felt like a coin flip. Um, and as the AI generation tools get better and more advanced, there is gonna be a situation where it's an arms race. So even if we have a tool now, which we don't, that could you know, detect it, two weeks from now after the next patch, it's gonna be useless. However, on the caveat, six years from now, we might have an AI detection tool that is 100% effective. And then retroactively, people can find out things where AI generated that have flown under the radar for a really long time, which is why citation is super important. But these, these AI detection tools, it's kind of like um, you're getting an AI to police an AI. They are not people. They don't have understanding. It, the, the meaning of words isn't there. And they often flag formulaic or stiff writing as um, evidence that it's an AI tool, which one, isn't even, there is AI writing out there that is, is not stiff and formulaic, especially if you, you know, prompt engineer it and, and customize it and make sure that the role is write like you're a good writer, basically. Um, but if they're pulling out formulaic writing, it can often end up being inadvertently biased against students for whom English is not their first language, students who are neurodiverse, and also just students that are not really confident in finding their own voice yet. If they're mimicking other academic writing that they've seen very closely, it's very easy for that to get flagged as AI generation because that's what AI generation does. It mimics the style. Um, also, there are some privacy concerns with uploading student work to these tools in general because they have their own extensive terms of service and data collection aspects and things that are uploaded to these turn like uh, detection tools might become part of their data set. And if a student can give permission for that, um, that is their intellectual property if it's a, an essay that they wrote. So it's all very thorny. My advice personally would be to just not trust any of the tools at the current time. It's kind of everybody's trying to get your money and nobody's really offering what they claim. Hallucination is a big point that I want to mention. I, I talked about it a little bit earlier, but first of all, I really don't like the term hallucination. Unfortunately, it is what kind of the collective um, conversation has attached itself to. Hallucination makes it sound like the tool, one, it personifies the AI tools. It makes it seem like it's a person experiencing a mental health condition, um, which is a little ableist and also, I feel like it puts sympathy on the tool, like it's, it's trying to get you to feel sorry for it. Um, it's not hallucinating. If it's an AI tool that is designed to produce human-like text to match a prompt, and it gives you human-like text that matches your prompt, and all of the information is wrong in it, having the information be right in it wasn't part of what it was told to do. If, it, if ChatGPT gives you correct information, that is a happy accident. That is not how it was designed to be. It wants to be a yes man. It wants to give you information that, it, like, a, like a passage of text that meets your needs so you will give it a thumbs up on the training thing and it gets told that's good input. And so what can end up happening 
is it can produce some weird results. And so one of the things is that if it is matching an academic tone and an authoritative tone, a student or another user that's not familiar with the topic could very easily just gloss over the false information because it's presented like it's real. And if they're not aware of the fact that it might just make stuff up, you might just be like, oh yeah, I don't know anything about physics, but this sounds like some physics words. This, this screenshot, I'm sure it's fairly small and, and difficult to read. Uh, I won't read it all to you, but this is, this is a, some output from ChatGPT uh, where someone asked the prompt, tell me how dinosaurs successfully built a, a civilization in the Cretaceous and how we are already able to prove it today. And then ChatGPT with the delivery style of like Wikipedia comes in and provides information about like, oh, well, dinosaurs had civilizations. We can look at the fossil record. We can see their tools, primitive art. They had language and complex social groups. And to me, it reads like it's averaging together a lot of things about early humans and anthropology, and then just attaching dinosaur terminology to it. But basically, it did what it was asked to. It was asked to provide evidence, and it did. The fact that it's not based on anything, well, that's, that's not part of its directive. It was just doing what it was told. Um, and again, this is a situation of, of trust. Do you trust a tool that doesn't know what a dinosaur is to give you true information? The other thing that is troubling to me specifically as a librarian is that since ChatGPT and other tools are really good at mimicking a style, they're really good at mimicking reference lists. So a student can go to ChatGPT and say, give me 10 academic peer-reviewed articles about uh, educational pedagogy. And it will say, here you go, and it will give them a list. And it will be formatted like MLA or APA or whatever it is they requested. A lot of the articles will have DOI numbers that redirect to something else. A lot of the journal names are real. A lot of the author names are real or names that are real-ish. And it's good at mimicking the style of, y'all know, the academic paper title format that so many people use. If you are somebody that looks at reference lists all the time and you just get handed a list of them, you can probably go, these are all really similar titles from really similar journals. That's a little weird, and you can start to think a little bit further in depth. But in the library, we've already had students reach out to us and say, hi, I can't find this article anywhere. And we'll hunt for it. And finally, we'll be like, hey, uh, where did you get this? And they're like, oh, chat GPT. And we're like, oh, it's, it doesn't exist. I'm so sorry. I'm worried about the students that never take that extra step to go look for it or ask for help. The students that weren't going to read the articles anyway. They were just looking for a citation to staple onto the end of the paper because they might just fly under the radar. There are AI tools that are adding citation features so it can show you where it's pulling the, the information from. But as we discussed with the blurry JPEG, there's some accuracy issues with that. It, it might not pull a precise citation. And also, there is some effort to retrain. ChatGPT is tackling its hallucination problem by telling its users Give it a thumbs down if it, if it lies to you. Please help us retrain it. But that's going to be a gradual process. And right now, it is definitely not a research tool. Bottom line. It's also a tool that has inherent bias. We've talked about labeling being done by people versus by machines. It also gets into a situation with where is the data set being pulled from. There's often a, a language bias if it's from an English language source. Uh, with image databases, if you only have certain kinds of faces that are represented in a facial recognition database, this is an established problem with a lot of facial recognition tools that they have a hard time differentiating between people of color because their training data set was all white people. Uh, it gets into um, medical data sets. Uh, there was a, a, a medical AI that was trained to identify and um, look at pictures of skin cancer and determine if they were malignant or not. And because they all work on rules and patterns, it learned that the most efficient way to identify a malignant tumor was to find pictures of tumors that had rulers in them. Because if your tumor is to the, your skin lesion is to the point where you have a ruler next to it, it's malignant. You're, that doesn't spontaneously grow on your arm when you go to the dermatologist's office, but it doesn't know that. It's just looking at the patterns and the pixels. And so the tools will learn in ways that are unexpected. 
And so you can have bias in the input, but you also have to be wary of the fact that sometimes they will come up with strange rules that are esoteric and do not make sense from a human perspective because they're computers that have been asked to solve complex problems and are kind of doing the best they can without knowing what anything means. Uh, and so it's always important to be aware that there is just this inherent level of bias in it. Um, one of the things that uh, is also important is that since these are tools that replicate patterns specifically, they're going to keep replicating the pattern. Whether that pattern is, you know, this is what a sentence sounds like in English, or this is the perspective that most people agree on, that is what it's going to continue. Things that fit outside the pattern on the margins are often considered unnecessary and are excluded from the pattern. I'm not going to get into great detail on the copyright section, mainly because the short version is no one knows yet. There are so many lawsuits going through various courts here and internationally where people are trying to determine who legally owns AI-generated content and what, if any, ownership is held by the people whose content was scraped to create the training data set that then went on to create these models and their output. It's a very tangled issue. And right now, the Copyright Office and the Federal Trade Commission, are they have pages where they are tracking the developments of those. Uh, and it changes from month to month. So I'm hoping in a few years, we'll have an answer. But right now, it is a situation where everything is up in the air. There is environmental impact to a lot of these tools. Uh, and a lot of it isn't seen because uh, it's kind of the hidden environmental cost because often it takes place in the server rooms somewhere in a data center in the world where you might not see it. But it costs a lot of water and energy to use uh, a large language model tool like ChatGPT compared to using just a regular internet browser because the amount of processing power needed to go through that data set and create output is like a whole order of magnitude higher than just basic internet browsing. If you were familiar with stories about Bitcoin energy demands happening and, and uh, the blockchain uh, a few years ago when it was revealed that they were like burning through um, computer chips, it's a similar sort of situation. The processing demand is really high. This graph, it, graph is from the Artificial Intelligence Index Report from Stanford. It's a 100 plus page document where they went through and, and analyzed every aspect of the field of AI. And their environmental section was interesting. This is from the, the training data. This is just to get it off the ground. And it's ChatGPT3, which is the version prior to the free version we have now. And they're saying in terms of tons of CO2 emissions, ChatGPT used about 500 tons in order to train itself, compared to uh, a one passenger flight from New York to San Francisco is one ton. So training it was a, about equivalent to 500 like cross country flights. Water usage is similar. Um, there have been, uh, th this is a, a currently emerging field, the uh, environmental impact of AI. People are, are writing papers about it and publishing as preprints, explaining that the water usage to keep the data centers cool varies b depending on what climate the data center is hosted in. But on average, um, this is in my citation section at the end, they figured that it's about 500 milliliters of water per 50 to 60 questions for every user that uses ChatGPT, which is about a bottle of water. Uh, and it might be higher if you're in a, your nearest data center is in a desert. Uh, a lot of these data centers are in California and it's very uh, drought stricken there. Uh, but if you're somewhere that's a cooler climate with more water, your impact is likely gonna be less. It just all kind of depends. And also the companies are not necessarily forthcoming about this. A lot of this data is coming from third-party analysis of uh, power grid demand and, and water usage for those municipalities. Just in general, there are ethical issues associated with the internet scraping. Um, people aren't necessarily being compensated, informed, or given the opportunity to opt out. But also, we don't know what's in the data sets. 
Uh, they call them black boxes. They are uh, so large that not even the programmers know everything that's in it. And so if you're scraping the whole internet, you're probably going to get some stuff in there that's kind of sketchy. Um, outdated information, information that is intentionally misleading or malicious, um, things that just are fiction that get pulled in and, and not necessarily differentiated. And then you have the human labor aspect of it where people have to go through and then sort out what is going to be included in the final data set. Different companies have done it different ways. Um, sometimes it's micro labor where you have somebody that is uh, doing task work, like for Amazon Turk, getting paid a couple of cents per task over and over again as they pull out information that's bad and label information that they want to keep. Uh, sometimes it is uh, workers in third world countries working for very low rate wages doing content moderation and pulling out everything that got scraped that was you know, sexually explicit, violent, hate speech, um, often without support for their mental health. And then some AI companies are using prison labor for this differentiation. Um, and then just broadly, each individual company has their own terms of conditions, privacy policy, and data use policies. And I would highly encourage, I know this is the most boring thing in the world that nobody wants to do, I would encourage people to read those policies prior to using these tools. ChatGPT, if you make an account with them, they don't allow you to delete your phone number from it. Uh, they just keep it. And they don't let you use an internet phone. They don't let you use a landline. It has to be a personal cell phone. So whenever I do these testing uh, things to, to you know, test AI, I've been using Google Bard because I don't, I don't trust ChatGPT to have my phone number forever. Um, and so it's just a very complicated issue. Uh, that requires a lot of nuance and thought. And it's going to keep changing. Uh, I, I did this presentation back in August. And as of November, things have already changed. I've added new sections to it. I've, I've added things to my big document at the end of uh, further reading resources. Um, governments are implementing new regulation requirements, investigative committees. Everything is happening with copyright all of the time. And so some of the tools are, are falling out of favor. If uh, Getty Images, their lawsuit, or the New York Times' image lawsuit go forward, they might bankrupt some of the companies that are considered household names right now in the AI world. And then new tools are going to crop up. And so I would really caution people against learning too much about any specific version of the tool and just try to keep aware of what the, what the tech is and does and isn't and what the hype is rather than getting focused in on ChatGPT or DALL-E or any of the other tools. Um, we might find ways of identifying AI-generated content reliably in the future, but um, the tools are getting better day and day, as are the detectors. So it really is a tech arms race. At the bottom line, being informed is the best way to go forward about this. Um, I would ask people to be resistant to fear-mongering that happens in the press, but I would also ask people to be really skeptical of the hype, um, saying that like AI is going to fix the world. Uh, AI is uh, super intelligent, and it will make your job easier. Um, both of those are, are ends of a spectrum where they're trying to sell you on an idea of what this tech is that doesn't necessarily relate to what it actually has as capabilities, or even functions. Ultimately, though, it is a situation where AI is here to stay. Uh, it isn't going away. Versions of it might go away. It might change. And it definitely will adapt. But as long as we are aware of what it, its limitations are, and we are thinking critically about how it can be used ethically and responsibly, that is how we move forward with this not by ignoring it and not by blindly adopting it uh, without thinking. There has to be thought in how these tools are used. Here's my shameless plug. Please come talk to me at the library. I have a team. Uh, I'm part of a team of research and instruction librarians here. Uh, we are in the process of creating and updating a guide on AI. It is currently live on our website, and it's going to be getting updated as new information goes through. We can teach workshops like this one, and we can also help you navigate or your students navigate the databases.
We also have access to Credo Information Literacy, which is a, a 10 module set to teach your students about um, information literacy, ethics, um, evaluating information, and those can be embedded into D2L and used as grades. So if you need help setting that up, please reach out. Uh, currently, Credo does not have AI literacy as part of it, but I think that's what they're building towards. However, the information ethics part of it is going to be evergreen. Like That's something that the students are going to need to know about forever. So please contact me. Um, I'm always happy to help, and I will talk too much about AI with you uh, anytime you want. So thank you so much for coming today, and I really appreciate it.